Our next guest is Birgitta Jonstotter. I had a lot of fun interviewing her. She's got a very wonderful personality. And before she became a member of the Icelandic Parliament in April 2009, she worked as a writer, artist, activist, web developer, and designer. She says that she's everything but your traditional politician. She's a poetician, which I love. Her political views are not expressed um, because she thinks that politics are something beyond her everyday life. Politics is life. Being political is having opinions. Every person has the opportunity to change the world. And that is Birgitta Jones' daughter's philosophy. Birgitta Jones' daughter, welcome to Cindy Sheehan Soapbox. Thank you so much for having me and giving me a chance to uh, stand on the soapbox. Well, thank you. And thank you for your commitment. I, I know you're a huge advocate for um, transparency uh internet freedom and whistleblowers but also for peace you've been a long time peace activist haven't you yes i have ever since i can remember actually so um i i was fortunate enough to have um a mother that was uh very active uh in the peace movement in iceland uh and she was also iceland's first woman to be uh so-called troupatrix. Uh, she uh, made music to her own songs and would travel around Iceland uh, playing for, you know, working class people, old people and anybody that wanted to listen to her. Uh, but she made music to the most amazing uh, poetry mm-hmm. uh, uh, by Icelandic poets. So uh, I, I, I started on very early to uh, understand the fundamentals in life. <laughs> You are very fortunate. Um, I, you know, I didn't start, and I always felt this way, but I didn't start being an activist till my son was killed. And I often think, you know, what what would it have been like if, you know, things were different? But you can't, you can't look back. You can only look forward. Exactly. I mean, I think uh, the biggest change in my life was actually when my father died. I was around twenty, mm-hmm. uh, and it made me go into a very uh, profound soul search to try to understand um, what I needed to do in order to both uh, go beyond my own self-destruction, but most importantly, how could I learn from this to be a better person? Mm -hmm. Uh, And um, so I was... um, I've been fortunate. Uh, I mean, often people think that tragedies are bad, but, uh, you know, as difficult as they are when you are feeling them, it is just like in society, the only time in our lives when we're ready to uh, take on profound change. Right. Well, it's, um, first of all, unfortunately, um, tragedy, heartbreak is a human condition, but I think the victory or the healing of that comes with our personal response to it. Yeah, exactly. There are so many ways we can go, and I think that's where we have a choice on which way are we going to go. So um, once in a while when I have an extremely interesting guest, and you're one of those times, um, all my guests are interesting, but sometimes I have extremely interesting guests. And, and I would like to thank you also because you're going to be um, our featured guest on our fifth anniversary show. So um, thank you so much for that. But wow. I, I, I know I can't believe we've been on for five years already. Um, I open it up to my supporters and listeners to ask questions and and you were you're one of my Facebook friends, so you were involved in this discussion on my wall on my Facebook wall yesterday. But as you see, there's a lot of people who were very interested um, in asking you questions. Now, in, here in the United States and all over the internet, 
you know, especially Facebook. There's a lot of memes about how Iceland really made those evil bankers pay for what they did to the country. But that's not exactly true, is it? And I think that I'd like to hear um, because we, you know, we need a good model of what to do in these situations, but we need true models, not fake legends. So, Birgitta, could you tell my listeners about what really happened in Iceland over the um, the horrible economic collapse? Yes, I can. And I'm, I'm very pleased that I can maybe uh, break some of the myths. Uh, I mean, a lot of good things happened, uh, but not all of the myths are true. So I'm going to just go through it uh, stage by stage because I know uh, people are looking for inspiration. And I totally agree with you. It is so important that the inspiration is based on facts. Mm-hmm. Now, the, the first thing that happened was that the government that was sitting during the financial collapse um, desperately tried to bail out the banks. They, they went seeking for loans uh, with our allies and friends, but our allies and friends said, no, we're not going to give you money uh, so that you can carry on in this insanity. So uh, we didn't receive any loans, and thus there had to be a plan B. And then this plan B was actually quite good because uh, it meant that we did not bail out the banks because we simply couldn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, there were. it's important that people understand that uh, prior to the collapse in Iceland, uh, five years earlier, the banks were, were privatized. And in that process, something criminal happened. Uh, and uh, the the new bank owners didn't really buy them. They just lent each other money for the uh, first payment. Right. And so the level of corruption was so deep, despite the fact that uh, on uh, uh, the uh, index for corruption, uh, Iceland was ranked the least corrupt country. And I remember when I saw that, I couldn't believe my eyes. <laughs> I didn't know if I should cry or laugh. But I know. Huh? I did both. <laughs> and uh, so because we're very tiny, there are 320,000 people living in Iceland. Uh, our economy is very fragile. So during the times of privatization, uh, they, the banksters used a loophole uh, because we are not a part of the EU, but we are part of the EEA, the European Economic Area, which means that 80% of our laws are EU laws. And, uh, and so when people say we shouldn't join the EU, uh, we are sort of in the EU without the privileges of actually being able to impact any lawmaking. Uh-huh. So um, that's one myth uh, that I, I need to shatter as well. So um, they used the loophole in the EA, EA law and created banks in other countries. And then a very incredible Ponzi scam started. Uh, and by the end of it, uh, they had expanded uh, the debt to five times our GDP just in five years. Wow. Unbelievable. And, of course, it it can never be justified that uh, these uh, debts would be rolled over on the taxpayer's shoulders. But that was the intention of the previous government, that the people then actually uh, were so shocked uh, because, like, the it was because we are small, the... Uh, they managed somehow to keep the banks open. So there wasn't like a massive run on any banks or anything like that. Uh, but because of what happened, we were faced with something like uh, a complete discredit in the rest of the world. And the British used, uh, the British government um, used uh, a, a, an anti-terrorist law on Iceland, uh, which led to um, none of the Icelandic companies uh, or uh, uh, others that had credit lines could have any credit lines and living on an island and facing food and medicine shortages did not help. And we were forced during this very sensitive time uh, to uh, uh, sign a memorandum of understanding that we would roll over the so-called ISIV accounts onto the shoulders of the nation. And I can sort of understand the previous finance minister like sitting with all the big guy, big cats uh, at the uh, the EU at this special meeting, uh, being faced with either I sign this memorandum of understanding or there will not be food in Iceland. Wow. And so he 
did. And uh, but in it, there was like the the ironic part was that the British and the Dutch government, both being previous colonist nations, uh, treated us like their previous colony, even if we were not theirs mm-hmm. uh, ever. Um, and uh, smeared a lot of uh, interest on this uh, debt that they wanted uh, the Icelandic nation to acknowledge uh, as a national debt instead of a private debt. And so that was one thing that we managed to actually stop. Uh, and that was through a joint... That was because of the people of Iceland. That was not solely resting on the Icelandic president. And it is important that people understand that the Icelandic president is merely a cookie decoration. He is not like the U.S. uh, president. Uh, He is like, um, uh, because we have an old constitution that is um, uh, recycled from the Danish, uh, which they were our colonists until uh, 1944, Um, he is sort of like the old uh, king rather than a president. Uh-huh. Uh, and it is the government, uh, the governmental body that makes all the main decisions. And uh, But after he had been sort of uh, partying quite wildly with the, um, the banksters, the Icelandic oligarchs, and praising them, so he was very unpopular at the time, after the collapse. So he... His only choice was when the nation pleaded with him to not sign, his role is to sign laws, Uh not to sign it. Uh, His only choice to regain some sort of uh, grace was to uh, do the bidding of the nation. There was a a massive campaign to get, uh, to stop this because if we would have uh, acknowledged this debt, uh, we would have gone bankrupt. And, um, not only that, uh, Mike, almost all our income tax would have gone into only paying the interest of this debt. So this was massive stuff. Uh, and we managed to get actually national referendums twice, uh, on the uh, ISAFE uh, contract. Uh, we did not, and we haven't been able, this is very complicated to get the uh, banksters into jail. Right. Uh, they have been sort of charged, but they're taken into higher courts. Uh, and they were quite a heavy sentencing uh, quite recently, but they're not yet in prison. Um, and there have some people been put into prison, but they get very easily off, like, you know, their prison terms and so forth. We have a very different justice system in Iceland. So uh, uh, life in prison is only 16 years, and you usually only serve that time, uh, like uh, half that time. Uh Uh, But uh, compared to Icelandic uh, prison sentencing, the the newest and the biggest uh, ruling was for uh, five years, which is quite uh, big in Iceland. But in my opinion, for, you know, they, they ruin so many people's lives. Right. Uh, there are people that will never recover from what happened here. And uh, so I think they're getting off actually quite light. But I would prefer to see the, the white collar criminals actually go into um, community work for the rest of their lives, uh-huh. uh, you know, working as garbage collectors <clears throat> or whatever. Uh, because, you know, I, th- I think that you know, at some states, our laws are actually, we have to acknowledge that all the laws in the world, and this is what I've discovered since I became a parliamentarian, all the laws in our world are not written by the people that are representing. It is written by lobbyists. Right. And it is this perfect marriage between the corporate and the state that is one of the big factors in killing our societies. Well, if we believe in restorative justice, then... Um, you know, the, the so-called punishment fitting the crime, you know, makes more sense. Like people think that George Bush and Dick Cheney should be executed for war crimes, but I think they should probably be put to work mopping floors in Iraqi orphanages or something like that. I think that would be, I mean, but I don't know, would that punish the people of Iraq even more to have to see their (laughs) ugly faces every day? (laughs) 
<laughs> we don't need That's to. <laughs> yeah, we don't need to punish them anymore. <laughs> well, you know, I'm glad you're talking about this because the image that we get here in the United States is you have banksters chained to the walls in dungeons there, and you know, um, researching this, you know, our interview, I, I found that it's quite different. But I think it's quite different because it's a it's more quaint to your system you don't have a lot of white collar crime so you don't have any people that you know really know how to prosecute it or any laws that um are are you know relevant to what happened in iceland but is that why you ran for parliament and um through this whole scandal i actually i sort of just randomly uh, happened to enter into parliament. Uh, I, of course, never had any aspiration to be a politician. Uh, that's why I define myself rather as an activist or a politician. Uh, uh-huh. I love that the... politician. That's great. <laughs> so, uh, but I feel like I, I, because I was one of the very few people that was uh, constantly protesting during the good times in Iceland. Um, So I had been upholding uh, protests for nine months outside the Chinese embassy because of their treatment of Tibetans. Um, And so when the collapse came, I was the only sort of super known protester. So everybody was sort of calling me and asking Mm -hmm. me, where do I get megaphones? And Mm -hmm. do you need permits for this? And and, uh, so I immediately sort of got involved in helping with uh, the protests um, and uh, and was a part of a think tank that um, was created by a very diverse group of people on what we needed to do in order to prevent this from happening again. And uh, this think tank sort of developed into uh, a coalition of different grassroots movements. Uh, And in the end, we all felt that in order to achieve true change, we needed to go inside the system to change, to legalize uh, direct democracy uh, and to make you know, some legal tools so that we didn't have to stand and protest and throw food at a house in order to get rid of a government. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and actually at some states, the protests were actually uh, transforming into violence, which is very uncommon in Iceland because we are a nation, you know, our police doesn't even carry guns and um, uh, we don't have a military. So... um, but one of the main things that I felt were important and was one of the reasons I sort of helped co-create this political movement uh, was that I felt that we needed to change uh, our constitution. And I felt it, that the people needed to do it. And I felt that it was important to create uh, a new bridge into parliament uh, that was a bridge between the general public and uh, this place of power. Right. Um, and and I also, you know, I felt it was very important uh, to uh, to work on transparency and freedom of information legislation and, and so forth and accountability. Uh, so these were sort of my things. I also promised to be the annoying fly in the tent. If I would get in there, and I certainly uh, have, <laughs> right? <laughs> and um, but uh, yeah, so we actually after the collapse, one, some of the really interesting thing that happened was that I actually like we got the seven point two percent of the vote, my political movement, uh-huh. uh, on no budget. Uh, eight weeks prior to elections, we were created. I decided to run in my constituency, like a month before the elections. Uh, And I was sort of shocked when I realized that I was was sort of a public figure all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, uh, but this demand for a new constitution is not new. There actually, the current constitution was always uh, a sort of a um, a temporary uh, constitution. And, But the people in power do not want the general public to make the constitution. So despite this fact, we did a beautiful uh, project, uh, the Icelandic people. And so uh, the the previous government uh, that was just uh, elected out of the parliament in April this year, 
they set out with uh, a little help from my political movement uh, to start this uh, quest for uh, having the people uh, participate in um, discussing and shaping the new constitution. And the beauty of doing that is like even like in the United States, you have, uh, you know, a good constitution, but most people don't understand all the rules that have been applied to it. So you might have a really good sort of basis, but there has been no discussion about all the additional rules that fit in with the constitution. So you never know if somebody is breaking it or not. Like I participated in uh, suing Obama uh, for additions to the NDAA uh-huh. uh, last year uh, with a very dangerous uh, additions, giving the military the right to uh, to arrest anybody anywhere on the suspicion of terrorism uh, without trial and everything. So uh, uh, I... I helped or participated in this uh, project with Chomsky and Chris Hattis and, and many other great right, people. Right. Uh, and we won and then we lost, of course. Right. Uh, so uh, usually, you know, the first stage of justice is relatively good. And then you have to start to question the, uh, the higher, the higher up you go, less justice is available. Uh, and, uh, and of course, laws are written by and for the first, uh, for the one percent, uh, because they are the people that help create the laws, and they always evade the laws. It's a very interesting coincidence. But uh, the constitutional process is so important, not only for us here in Iceland. Uh, it is a discussion about what sort of society you want to be, and every generation has the right to discuss this uh, because we might shift and change. Uh, our perspectives and focuses, uh, even if, like, of course, there is always certain amendments that are just sort of holy, <laughs> you know, like privacy. Oh, I forgot. It's been broken so badly yeah. that you don't know what it is <laughs> It's <anymore>. not holy <laughs> anymore. It's holy, but it's H-O-L-E-Y, not, <laughs> not H-O-L-Y. It's filled with holes. Mm-hmm. And so in the like uh, in the constitutional process, we did everything right, uh, you know, apart from, of course, doing lots of mistakes because we're doing this for the first time. And those that were against the process um, made sure to try to use all the tiny errors to destroy the legitimacy of uh, the project. And so in the end, uh, this beautifully crafted uh, new constitution uh, has been thrown into the shredder just uh, in the last few days of the last uh, parliament and the young new leaders of the new uh, of the uh, of the left uh, they were fooled and they um, by the now current ministers that uh, run the country so um, um, it was a shame but I think um, I think it is important to bear in mind, even if we didn't finalize it, uh, we still have that document. Right. Uh, and uh, we we ha- had also some really other sort of profound uh, changes. Uh, and I think perhaps um, uh, one of the most important uh, changes in our societies was that the old structure of the parties is sort of eroding and collapsing. Uh, we usually have five parties in Parliament. We now have six. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, and uh, we, you know, I ran for the Pirate Party, which I helped create in Iceland, which is uh, a party focusing on 21st uh, century legislation in relation to uh, privacy, uh, freedom of information and expression, uh, copyright reform, uh, and uh, direct democracy. And these are all things that are very, very important to me. And just the fact that Iceland is the first country in the world to elect uh, pirates in their pir- uh, parliament mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, is a sign that we are still relatively open-minded. Uh, we also had an incredible mayor that uh, is going to quit uh, he, um, uh, for the, the biggest city in Iceland. Uh, an incredibly uh, brilliant uh, installation artist and a comedian uh, who puts humanity uh, and humanitarian work uh, as his main focus. Uh, and uh, he would have been easily re-elected as a mayor, 
but he decided to quit. It was just too painful to be around all these dishonest people. <laughs> oh, yes, it takes uh, a toll. Yeah. <laughs> it takes a toll, doesn't it? And um, But I think that the, maybe the most uh, uh, the thing that I am the prou- proudest to have gotten through the parliament and the way it sort of happened was the uh, Icelandic Modern Media Initiative, which was um, um, a parliamentary proposal. And a parliamentary proposal usually uh, entails that you task uh, a government to um, to write laws and then push them through the parliament. In this particular parliamentary proposal, which was to make Iceland into a safe haven for freedom of information, expression and speech, uh, which I worked with people from... Um, uh, all over the world, uh, and the people that helped the most with it were from WikiLeaks, uh, at the time a relatively unknown organization. Uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, uh, so they knew how to keep stuff up no matter what. And the main focus was to ensure that uh, news and information belonging in the public domain could be um, up and running, no mat- matter what sort of legal threats there would be, and to create proper whistleblowing laws and uh, uh, proper uh, uh, protections uh, for both media and sources uh, and encouragement. And somehow I got this through the parliament with a wall of green. Everybody said yes. Uh, and this has never happened in the history of the parliament of Iceland that uh, uh, a parliamentary proposal that is actually course defining where we're heading as a nation is passed. And not only that, the laws are being made, which is pretty remarkable. <laughs> and it just goes to show that, you know, anything can happen uh, if um, if you're at the right time uh, and you believe in, you know, what is important uh, and there is enough um sort of uh, brain power behind it to uh, to uh, encourage and support it. Well, Birgitta, unfortunately, we're running out of time, but you're an awesome interview because you answered all my questions without me even having to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> so I told you we were on the same wavelength. But yep. I just want to say, you know, I'm running for governor of California. I didn't know if you knew that, but... Um, you know, this is a, where California must be a hundred times bigger than Iceland. I don't know. We have about 40 million people in California. Wow. Uh, I, I, you, our, our capital city is bigger than Iceland, but you know, we want to use these things that, that you're doing, um, you know, and the uh, other successful models around the world, you know, like Venezuela, who Venezuela actually did rewrite their constitution. The people, wrote it, you know, and it has to be a document that that is, I think, relevant to the people and relevant to today. So I'd like you to get the Pi- California Pirates Party to endorse me for governor. All right. <laughs> uh, I, I now solemnly uh, urge them to do so. <laughs> well, you know. So, uh, no, but it, it's, uh, it is, like you said, it is very important that we uh, focus on solutions uh, and we have to create a new hardware for our systems so that we can actually put our new systems into something that will run them. And that means downsizing, downsizing, downsizing. Absolutely. So you're, you are a poetician and you have a wonderful website. Can you tell my listeners your website? Uh, yeah. So if they want to find all my stuff, they go to brigida.is. Uh, and it's a portal to all my different uh, spaces in cyberspace. And uh, my personal homepage I started to make in 95. It's very personal, lots of poetry, photos, art, uh, and my thoughts. Uh, so feel free to uh, to enter my, my private living room. <laughs> yes. So we do have to downsize, but um, with... Your help and the help of other people um, on this planet, hopefully we can still stay connected to each other with this um, open internet and all, but also to for privacy or privacy as you say to be um, paramount, but we need to stay connected to each other. 
Absolutely. And for if you want to use any of the image suggestions, the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative, you can go to immi.is uh, and it, feel free to use whatever you want to. Uh, we are in the co-creation together. And this show is also um, Creative Commons where it can be used, like you say, as long as people... Uh, you know, acknowledge and give us credit that it's the information we want to get out. We don't, we, I think it's so important that open source um, be our goal. Exactly. Well, well good luck with, uh, you know, uh, your running uh, for a senator and uh, governor. Happy, I'm running for, pr- I'm running oh, for governor, president. Governor, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> president of California, the Republic of California. So, Birgitta Jungstadter, awesome. thank you so much for being on Cindy Sheehan's Soapbox. It was really great to talk to you. Yeah, you too. Take okay. care. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, that's the wrap-up of our fifth anniversary show here at Cindy Sheehan Soapbox. I had asked some friends of the show and friends of mine to record congratulations for this um, show and nobody did actually except for Dr. Helen Caldicott and due to the service of um, uh, do it due to the bad service of um, something I'm not using anymore we lost her recording but Dr. Hel- Helen Caldicott is an amazing person and also the show I did with her last year was the most listened to show on Cindy Sheehan Soapbox. So again, I guess I'll just have to congratulate myself for the past five years and be proud of the show that we present to you every single um, week. Well, most weeks, unless I'm in jail or riding my bike across the country. As always, I'd like to thank Don DeBar for being the engineer and connection to CPR Metro. I'd like to thank Mike um, my producer, Mikey Kim, my on and off producer for arranging the interview with Birgitta. And as always, I'd like to thank you for listening and for supporting the show. I'm Cindy Sheehan. You've been listening to Cindy Sheehan Soapbox. Peace out for now. <laughs>